Thank you, brother. Isn't it nice to see the Lord's adding to our musicians? Thank you for playing the sax, sister. <laughs> and Brian, Robert. Amen. You love the Lord? Yes, amen. Amen. Are you amazed by the Lord? Yes. Amen. I am too. Well, let's welcome my son to come and give us the word this morning. Okay, so uh, today is Communion Sunday, and I just wanted to thank you guys for being here today. Um, this is, there's really a lot of opportunities today to be touched by the Lord. If you weren't touched by the worship, I pray that you'll be touched by the sermon. Um, I know we emphasize this a lot at the church, but maybe you haven't heard this message before, though the healing is for today. And... I know that there's many in the church that don't believe healing is for today. They, especially in the Western church, uh, they think that healing was only a long time ago in the Old Testament or the New Testament. Uh, during the biblical times, it was only necessary for people to be healed uh, so that the gospel could be preached and that the word of God could be confirmed. But we, as believers in this church, we believe that healing is part of the atonement, that when Jesus died, it was uh, for all of us today. It wasn't just for people back then. And so there's a reason behind a lot of that teaching. And really, I'm just going to say flat out that it's straight from the enemy, straight from the pit of hell. That it completely disregards scripture and that it assumes that all you need is, um, is faith in Jesus Christ uh, for your salvation and it, that you don't need anything else other than that. And it is important to understand that, yes, all we really need is to be, uh, is to be on the road to heaven, but Jesus paid for a lot more than that. And to deny his sacrifice of what he paid for, to deny uh, any trust in that, is really an act of unbelief. And we know that unbelief is a sin. And there's a lack of holiness, I think, in, in some people that don't believe that healing is for today. And what I mean by a lack of holiness is that they disregard, ultimately, the, the price that Jesus paid for us. And then there's some people in the church that believe healing is for today, but they don't see it. They, they believe that you know, God came to heal people, came to set the captives free, came to open blinded eyes, came to he open deaf ears, but they don't see it in their lives. And some maybe have died never seeing these miraculous things. And it's a real tragedy, I think, that you know, there's people that don't believe in the gifts at all, and then there's people that do believe, but they don't see them in action. And I really want us to both believe and see the gifts in action. I don't want it just to be a talking exercise, something that we discuss on Sundays, but we never actually see in our lives. And James tells us that faith without actions is dead. You know, he said that, yeah, you believe Jesus and God are one. You know, that's, that's awesome. He says, even the demons believe that. What more have you got to show for your faith? What have you seen? What have you done? Have you stepped out in faith? Have you walked on water? So, healing is for today. And we know this from the Old Covenant. In Isaiah 53, 5, it says, But he was pierced for our transgressions, he was crushed for our iniquities. Upon him was a chastisement that brought us peace. And his wounds, and with his wounds, we are healed. Jesus' blood paid for our salvation, our peace, and our healing. And to deny him that is to deny heaven of the greatest priority there is, and that's Jesus' blood. Jesus' blood is the number one priority of heaven. God, when he sent his son to die for us, he did it to restore us to proper health, to proper relationship with God. Adam and Eve, they didn't have sickness and disease in the garden. 
It wasn't until they sinned against God that sickness and disease came to them. And God wanted us to restore us to that right relationship with him. Moses, he lived to be 120. And it, the Bible says that his eyes didn't grow dim and that he was still full of vigor. And that's in the Old Covenant. That was God establishing a relationship with Moses, and Moses couldn't even see God face to face. But we now can see Jesus. And Jesus can do a mightier work than what he did in Moses. To where we're not only kept healthy, we're not only kept with our eyes bright, without any cloudiness of uh, without any cloudiness from dementia, without any cloudiness from uh, Alzheimer's, without any cloudiness from lack of eyesight, from uh, cataracts, Jesus can come and open our eyes, give us clarity in our mind. Jesus suffered and died for our salvation, peace, and healing. And we need to understand that you know, all his pain, all the suffering that he went through wasn't just for show. It was so that we wouldn't have to ever go through it. He took on the crown of thorns that we might never have to go through mental disorder or mental problems or problems in our mind, in our brain. Jesus took the crown of thorns for that. <laughs> the wounds he suffered on his back through the cat of nine tails, was to take, it says, by the stripes we are healed. The stripes that Jesus took on his back, we are healed because of that. He paid such a heavy price. And for us to deny him what he paid for is a crime against him. And we need to see the gifts, we need to see Jesus in action because he paid for it. He came to heal our entire body, mind, and soul. He was pierced in his heart with a spear. Blood and water was poured out. And if I think for one moment that Jesus' blood has lost the tiniest bit of power because the New Testament is complete, I have no idea what Jesus paid for. His suffering wasn't just to see us blessed in the afterlife. He came that we might have fellowship with God now, that we might live a holy life free from bondage, free from the bonds of sin, free from the bonds of sickness and disease free from the bonds of even deformities. Jesus came to set us free. When Jesus comes, he comes as a good shepherd. A good shepherd takes care of his sheep, finds the lost sheep, brings them home, binds up their wounds, Make sure that they're healed. Jesus bled for us. His blood is the number one priority of heaven. His blood was for our salvation, peace, and healing. To settle for anything less ignores what he paid for. Isaiah 61.1 When Jesus started his ministry, this is what he turned to in the Bible. He said... The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because the Lord has anointed me to bring good news to the poor. He has sent me to uh, bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives, and the opening of prison to those who are bound, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor and the day of vengeance of our God, to comfort all who mourn. God wants to destroy wickedness. Vengeance is His. And it's wickedness that has bound people and that has hurt them. It's sad that many of the people that believe 
it is God's will to heal. Sometimes they think, well, maybe it's not always God's will to heal. But right here, Jesus didn't say, I come up uh, because the Spirit of the Lord has anointed me to preach good news to some of the poor, or he has sent me to bind up some of the brokenhearted, or I have come to proclaim to some liberty to captives, or opening of prison doors to some people who are bound, or to comfort some who are mourning. He came to do it for all. That whosoever would believe in him would have everlasting life. He didn't say, I've come to do it for some people and not for everyone. I've come to heal some people, not everyone. People wonder, well, is it the will of God's will to heal? And if they don't see God healing people, they think, well, maybe it's not God's will to heal. You know, it says in the Bible that God is not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. But does that mean that everyone goes to heaven? No, it doesn't. Because Jesus said very clearly that there is a narrow road to heaven and that there is a wide and destru- uh, the wide is the way that leads to destruction and many are the people that find it. Jesus said that there's a lot of people going on that path of destruction, not on the narrow road. But he also said that it's not the will of the Father for any to perish. Just because it's the will of God doesn't mean that it's not always fulfilled. It's not God's will for people to go to hell. But people choose to go there. It's not God's will for people to be sick, to be hurting, to have disease. But people are. And it's not because it's not God's will. It is always God's will to heal. If it wasn't always God's will to heal, then it wasn't always God's will to save people. But it was always God's will to save people, always God's will to heal people. That's why Jesus paid such a heavy price. He didn't bleed out for people so that some people could be healed. He wanted a healing to be available for everyone. But you have to apply the blood to be healed. It's just like with uh, the people of Israel when the spirit of death came on on Egypt during Passover. They had to apply the blood to their doorpost in order for it to be effective. In order for it to prevent death from coming in. We have to apply the blood of Jesus in order to prevent death from coming in. To prevent sickness and disease from coming in. We have to plead the blood of Jesus every day and see it transform lives. So, Matthew 4.24, So the report of him spread throughout all Assyria, and they brought him all who were sick, those afflicted with various diseases, tormented, uh, torments, those under the power of demons, and epileptics, and paralyzed people, and he healed them. Does it say, and he healed some of them? No. It says, they brought him all who were sick, and he healed them. Matthew 8, Jesus heals many. And when Jesus entered Peter's house, he saw his mother-in-law lying sick with a fever. He touched her hand, and the fever left her. And she rose and began to serve him. That evening they brought to him many who were oppressed by demons, and he cast out the spirits with a word and healed all who were sick. This was to fill what was spoken by the prophet Isaiah. He took our illnesses and bore our diseases. Again, he healed all. didn't say that he healed some that came to him. He healed all. Mark 3.10. For he healed so many that uh, all who had distressing bodily diseases kept falling upon him and pressing upon him in order that they might touch him. He healed so many that all who had distressing bodily diseases kept falling upon him. That they might touch him, that he might be healed. The reason why they had to touch him is Jesus, he could not be made unclean. If you were touched by a sick person, that made you unclean. 
especially the woman with the issue of blood, if he was touched by her, he would be made unclean. But he cannot be made unclean, so immediately when she touched him, she was healed. When people touch Jesus, they're healed because he cannot be made unclean. Luke 6, 17 through 18, And he came down with them and stood on the level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and the sea coast of Tyre and Sidon who came to hear him and to, to be healed of their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits, with unclean spirits were cured. Uh, works he does in greater. In John fourteen twelve, he says, Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. If I am praying for people and I'm not seeing them healed, there's something wrong with me. Something wrong with my belief. You know, it's not to say that the person that I'm praying for, if, they, if they're not seeing uh, healing, that it, there's a problem with them. The problem is on me. He says, whoever do, believes in me will also do the works that I do. You know, Jesus went around healing people. It wasn't, um, it wasn't always the people that were healing themselves. There were times where Jesus told people, your faith has made you well. But that wasn't always the case. Those are some exceptions. And I think it was I exceptional because Jesus, he noted it and he was impressed by their faith. Um, just as a centurion came to him and Jesus said, you know, I haven't seen this type of faith in all of Israel. You know, the centurion said, you don't even have to see my servant. You just say the words and I know he's healed. I'm a man of authority. I know how it works. And Jesus was impressed. And the other times that he was impressed was at people's unbelief. Like the people in his hometown. That... Um, it says that he could do no mighty works there. Now, it doesn't say that he couldn't do mighty works there because people touched him and they weren't healed. I believe that he could do no mighty works there because they didn't approach him. They didn't ask him for help. They saw him just as a carpenter's son. Romans 8, 3 through 34. What if some were unfamiliar? Does their faithfulness nullify the... Uh, the faithfulness of God? You know, just because I pray for somebody and I don't see them healed, does that mean that God doesn't heal anymore? Does that nullify God's faithfulness? No. God is still faithful. By no means, let God be true and everyone were a liar, as it is written, that you may be justified in your words and prevail when you are judged. It's not a statement on God's will if I pray for somebody and they're not healed. That just means that I've been unfaithful and I need to be faithful to God to see that healing. In Matthew 7, 7 through 11, it says, Ask and it will be given. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives, and the one who seeks finds, and to the one who knocks it will be opened. Or which one of you, if his son asks him for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a serpent? If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will your Father who is in heaven give good things to those who ask him? We just have to ask him. In the parables of Luke 11 and Luke 18, in Luke 18 is the parable of the persistent widow. If you want to turn there, I'll give you some time. <laughs> but Luke 18, 1, we find the parable of a persistent widow. And he told them a parable to the effect that they ought always to pray and not lose heart. Isn't that something? Jesus taught us to pray and not lose heart. That means do we stop praying when we don't see it answered? No. 
we continue, we ought to pray, always pray, and not lose heart. He said, in a certain city there was a judge who neither feared God nor respected man. And, he was a wid and there was a widow in a city that, who kept coming to him and saying, give me, just, ju give me justice against my adversary. For a while he refused, but afterward he said to himself, Though I neither fear God nor respect man, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, I will give her justice, so that he will not beat me down, so that she will not beat me down by her continual coming. And the Lord said, Hear what the unrighteous judge says, and will not God give justice to his elect, who cry to him day and night? Will he del will he delay long over them? I tell you. He will give justice to them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? When Jesus comes back, will there be people that will cry out to him day and night to see prayers answered? You know, we ask, well, why does it have to be this way? I don't know. I'm not God. His ways aren't my ways. Maybe it's an act of humility. Maybe he has to break off a pride in us. Maybe we have these preconceived notions that we don't have to humiliate ourselves before God. We have to become desperate. Sometimes we have to become desperate to see God move. I don't know why that is. Sometimes you don't have to be. Sometimes you could just be walking and the Lord could just heal you just in a service, in, in his presence. I don't know exactly why. But again, he knows why. And I can trust in him and his faithfulness. And if I cry out to him, I can believe that he'll answer me. If I believe with my whole heart. Luke 11, it says, Now Jesus was praying in a certain place. And when he finished, one of his disciples uh, said to him, Lord, teach us to pray, as John taught his disciples. And he said to them, When you pray, say, Father, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Give us each day our daily bread, and forgive us our sins. For we ourselves forgive everyone who is indebted to us. And lead us not into temptation, and he said to them, Which of you has a friend? Will go to him at midnight and say to him, Friend, lend me three loaves. For a friend of mine has arrived on a journey, and I have nothing to set before him. And he will answer from within, Do not bother me, the door is now shut. And my children are with me in bed. I cannot get up and give you anything. I cannot get up and give you anything. I tell you, though, he will not get up and give him anything because he is his friend. Yet because of his impudence, he will rise and give him whatever he needs. And I tell you, ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and it will be opened to you. Everyone who asks receives and the one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks it will be opened. What, fa uh, what father among you, if his son asks for a fish, will instead, give, uh, will instead of a fish give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, we'll give him a scorpion. If you then who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? Again, he says persistence. You know, come to God. That you're not going to leave until he answers you. As a blind man cried out to him, Son of David, have mercy on me. Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus couldn't just walk by him. He had compassion on him. He said, he really is desperate. He says, what do you need? He says, I want to see. Jesus answered his prayer, opened his eyes. When they brought him before the Pharisees, they asked his parents, is it true that he was blind from birth? 
they didn't want to get caught up in it. They didn't want to get persecuted. So they said, he's of age, ask him. So they brought him in. Is it true you were blind from birth? Yes. They said, we know this man is a sinner. How can he have done this? You see, opening blinded eyes was the only, was the only miracle that only the Messiah could do. All the other miracles that Jesus had seen, people had done them before. Even raising of the dead, Elijah saw the dead raised. But no one had seen the blinded eyes open. That was a healing specific to the Messiah. Looking right in front of him was the Messiah. Opening this blinded man's eyes. They said, this man's a sinner. How can he possibly have opened your eyes? And he said, all I know is that I was blind and now I see. Jesus still comes to open blinded eyes. To give sight to the blind. Hearing to the deaf. And voice to the mute. He comes to see people not only just heal the physical problems, but also emotional, also mental, every kind of problem. Jesus endured it on the cross. He knows what you've gone through. God is omnipresent. That means that he was everywhere. He always has been everywhere. He always will be everywhere. And he was there suffering with you. God knows suffering more than any of us. He experienced it firsthand. And as our father, he's experiencing it every day. But God is so big and so full of so much love that it never breaks him. But he wants us to come into communion with him to be healed of all of our hurts, all of our past, everything that is done wrong to us, he wants to see it restored. He didn't come into the world so that we would have to suffer. He came into the world so we wouldn't have to suffer anymore. In Jeremiah 33, 3, it says, Call to me and I will answer you. And will tell you great and hidden things that you have not known. Maybe there's some things in your life that you've prayed for and you haven't seen healing for. And maybe it's because there's a hidden thing that you haven't known that is blocking that healing from coming to you. God wants you to know you can ask Him, Lord, what's blocking my healing? Lord, what's getting in the way? We can call and ask him. And if we keep on asking, he will answer. And he will show us great and hidden things that we haven't known. In Ephesians 1, it says, In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins, according to the riches of his grace, which he made to us, through which he made it to abound toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in himself, that in the dispensation of the fullness of the times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both which are in heaven and which are on earth in him. In him also we have obtained an inheritance being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things according to the counsel of his will, that we who first trusted in Christ should be, should be to the praise of his glory. In him you also trusted, after you heard the, tr- the word of the truth, the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also having believed, you were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise, who is the guarantee of our inheritance until the redemption of the purchased possession to the praise of his glory. 
And what good is an inheritance if we can't enjoy it now? If we can't enjoy the blessings that Jesus paid for, what good is it? God wants us to enjoy the provision that he's provided for us. To enjoy every sacrifice that he endured for us. He wants us to enjoy life, to enjoy him, to enjoy communion with him. And when they approached the multitude, this is Matthew 17, 14. Again, in Matthew 17, 14, we see an instance of Jesus' disciple praying for someone and they, not see, they didn't see healing. So when they approached the multitude, a man came up to him, <laughs> kneeling before him and saying, Lord, do pity and have mercy on my son, for he has epilepsy and he suffers terribly for, frequent, for, fre- oh, sorry, for frequently he falls into the fire and many times into the water. And they brought him to your disciples, and they were not able to cure him. And Jesus answered, O oh, you unbelieving, warped, wayward, rebellious, and thoroughly pers- uh, perverse generation, how long am I to remain with you? How long am I to bear with you? Bring him here to me. And Jesus rebuked the demon, and it came out of him. And the boy was cured instantly. Then the disciples came to Jesus and asked privately, Why could we not drive it out? He said to them, because of your littleness of your faith, that is your lack of firmly relying and trusting, your firmly, lack of firmly relying trust. For truly I say to you, if you have faith that is living like the grain of a mustard seed, you can say to this mountain, move from here to yonder place and it will move and nothing will be impossible for you. Nothing will be impossible to you. And then in verse 21 it says, but this kind does not go out except by prayer and fasting. In kind, um, the word kind, he doesn't specifically address what kind. He doesn't say this kind of demon. And we can infer that that's what he's talking about is this kind of demon. But maybe he's also talking about this littleness of faith. This lack of faith uh, comes out through prayer and fasting. That we grow in our faith when we pray and we fast. And we seek God. We cry out to him day and night. The lack of faith was the culprit behind the boy's lack of healing. It wasn't that it wasn't God's will to heal him. You know, Jesus didn't say, oh, well, it's just not God's will to heal him. Don't worry about it. Jesus told him it was because of your lack of faith. Jesus never told somebody, oh, well, I'm sorry, it's not God's will to heal you, so, you know, just just be happy. Or some people say, oh, well, God uses sickness and disease to teach us a lesson. Jesus never went to somebody and say, oh, you were sick and you had disease. Did you learn your lesson? I'm not going to heal you until you learn your lesson. Jesus never said that to someone. It is not God's will for people to suffer and to learn from their problems. God wants us to learn from our problems, yes, and he can use sickness and disease to teach us a valuable lesson, but that's not what God does. God doesn't put the sickness and disease on us. He could do that, but he doesn't. I'm not saying that God can't use anything for his glory. God can use everything for his glory. You know, it doesn't matter what hand God has dealt. He wins with every card that he's dealt. Because he can change the rules. He wrote the rules. So, it is not God's will for people to suffer. It is not God's will for people to have disease. And I want us to ask him today to heal us. And if we don't even know how to ask, let's ask him for help. Let's call on him for help. As it says in Jeremiah. Today today is Communion Sunday. And I want 
us to experience God's healing touch as we remember what he did for us. He said communion was for us to remember what he did. He said, do this in remembrance of me. He wants us to remember. He doesn't want us to forget. Sometimes there's there's spirits that they keep people from healing. And the reason they can keep people from healing is because they have a legal right to stay. And we give legal rights to demons when we walk in unforgiveness, when we walk in sin, unrepentant sin. When we've refused uh, to give it to God, we open the door. Maybe we've opened the door in the past, or maybe somebody else has opened the door too. It's not always our fault. Sometimes somebody in our past has opened a door to the demonic, and we need to repent of that sin. You know, Job, he asked for forgiveness for his sons and daughters. You know, it's okay to ask for forgiveness for your children, for your, for your ancestors. You know, ask God, forgive my ancestors, Lord. They, they sinned against you, Lord. Forgive them, Lord. You know, we need to cancel any right that any demon has claimed to us. If a demon came in through an ancestor that they claimed, laid claim to us because of that, we need to cancel that. If a demon came in because of our uh, sin, because of our unfaithfulness, we need to repent, ask God for forgiveness. If a demon came in because we haven't forgiven someone, there will be torment until we forgive that person. You know, and it's not worth it to hold on to unforgiveness. If that person ruined the first half of your life, what do you want to get to, why would you allow them to continue to ruin the rest of your life? Don't allow somebody that's ruined the first part of your life to ruin the rest of your life by allowing you to uh, stay in unforgiveness. You need to break out of unforgiveness. Forgiveness is something we do for ourselves, not just for another person. God wants us to walk in forgiveness. Jesus said, you know, if if you don't forgive, you won't be forgiven and that you'll be thrown into torment, <coughs> eternal gnashing of teeth. You know, people who are in unforgiveness are already in torment because they've opened the door for the enemy. So we need to get through, we need to get through past sins of our ancestors, our own sin, and we need to get rid of unforgiveness. We need to forgive. If we close those doors, we have legal right to tell demons to leave. We can tell them, you have no more authority here. My ancestors have been forgiven, I've been forgiven, and I've forgiven all those who've hurt me. You have no more legal right to stay. I command you to leave in Jesus' name. When we do those things, we'll see breakthrough. Maybe there's a spirit of infirmity that's been on you. When we do those things, we see a breakthrough. We see things change. <clears throat> Maybe it's just this fallen world that has come on you, just slimed you with whatever it is. The enemy has just thrown everything at you. We can command healing to come. We don't command God to do something. We command uh, the healing to respond to God. We command whatever it needs to be healed to respond to God. Just as Jesus said, you can command a mountain to go over yonder and it will have to obey. We can command disease and sickness to do the same. That's the authority that God's given us. Because he doesn't want it in us. He wants it to go. So God is limitless. He's without any restrictions but he wants us to be obedient, to listen, to ask. And sometimes people are healed not even th through people not even asking. And it's just the overflow of God's love. But God wants us to ask him. 
because he wants us to know that he was the one behind it. I don't know what people may be going through right now, physically, mentally, spiritually, in their past, emotionally. Whatever you may be dealing with, whether it's stress, depression, um, maybe you just have a lack of energy. I mean, you hear all, all the time on the radio, oh, do you have lack of energy? Oh, we'll take this pill, it'll make you better. You know, when, I mean, a pill is not gonna really do much. It, maybe you, it, you have just, um, you're struggling in some area. Maybe you, there's even an area of sin in your life that you're struggling in. God doesn't want you to struggle with sin. He says he came to free the captives, to open prison doors. He doesn't want you bound. He doesn't want us bound by addiction, <laughs> bound by our sin. He wants us free, liberated. To be healed of that is just as important, if not more important than to be healed of sickness and disease because we're released to be holy for him, to be used by him. So whatever you're going through, be it sin, be it sickness, be it disease, be it mental disorder, mental problems, m mental anguish, um, suffering of any kind, God wants to heal it. Any deep, emotional wounds. God wants to heal it. Maybe a, a divorce in your family has, has ruined the, the way you love, the way you experience love, the way you accept love, the way you receive love, the way you give love. God wants to heal that. God hates divorce because he sees the damage that it does to people. He knows that it hurts people. God wants to heal you Maybe an abortion. Maybe you, you willingly had it. Maybe you were coerced into it. God wants to heal that. The pain of that. You have to repent of it. You know, it is murder. But God forgives. God says, thank you for repenting. Your child's with me. I needed you to ask for forgiveness and God will release the healing. We renounce it. We say, Lord, I was wrong. God forgives. He doesn't come to condemn us. Jesus said, I haven't come into the world to condemn it, but I've come to save it. So if we could begin passing out the communion, I'm gonna start praying for God to open up his clinic. We wanna to come together and we wanna, God's clinic goes much deeper than any medical knife can, than any psychiatrist or, or sociologist can can uh, tell us where he's going. You know, God can go deeper in the mind. He can go deeper into your past. He could go into generations. Maybe there's generations that not only have, have sinned, but maybe there's generations that have been sinned against. Where your ancestors have been so, were so tormented, so treated badly it has passed on terrible things. You know, God wants to heal that too. He, he wants to heal the torment of, of generations. He wants to heal. So if we could begin passing out the communion, um, I'm just gonna say a prayer over it. And I really want people to really just to really relax and yield to the Lord. Let him do his work. You don't even have to pray yourself. Just open yourselves up to Jesus' healing touch. I'll do the praying for you. Just relax. 
Let the Holy Spirit come. Let him touch you. Even if there's areas that, that you're not really even sure that you, you need healing in, the Holy Spirit will reveal to you areas that you need healing in, areas that you need touching. Or maybe it's areas you need to repent in. The, let the Holy Spirit reveal to you the areas that you need to repent. Maybe it's for your ancestors. Maybe it's for yourself. Maybe it's for what's been done to you, what's been done to your ancestors. But you need to forgive what's done to your ancestors. You need to forgive what was done to you. And you need, you just need to relax and let the Holy Spirit just yield your members to Him and He'll, He'll come. He'll, he'll, he'll help you receive what you need. So Lord, uh, I just ask right now, Lord, for everyone who is in any type of pain, any type of suffering, Lord God, be it mental, physical, spiritual, Lord Jesus, uh, be it torment, Lord God, from the enemy, uh, be it depression, Lord God, be it sickness, disease, whatever, Lord God, someone is going through right now, Lord God, in any form of melody, Lord God, any any form of anguish, Lord Jesus, that somebody is suffering, any form of torment that someone is enduring, Lord God, I want to come against that now in the name of Jesus. Lord, we know the price you paid. We're remembering what you paid right now, Lord God, as we take communion. We're remembering, Lord God, that your body was broken for us. That, Lord God, your blood was spilled for us. That, Jesus, you came, you died for it our sickness, for our disease, for our broken hearts. You came to mend the broken heart of Jesus, to open prison doors. If anybody is suffering, Lord God, with addiction to any type of sin, Lord God, we ask that you would come now, Lord Jesus. Set the captives free, Lord God. Release people, Lord God, to live a new life, Lord God, as a new creation in you, Jesus. Lord God, maybe in order to walk in that healing, they need healing in their past. And Lord God, we ask right now that you would come into people's past. You would show them, Lord God, that you were there with them suffering. And then, Lord God, if, if they can't even be brought into that memory, Lord God, we just pray that you remove any form of that memory from them, Lord God. That you would even just cause supernatural uh, amnesia, Lord God, to take effect, Lord Lord, where it would not where they wouldn't even remember, Lord God, the sins that were done against them, Lord Jesus. And they would just feel compelled, Lord God, to forgive. Just say, as you said, Lord God, how to pray. I forgive all who have sinned against me. If anyone wants to join in in that prayer, just say, I forgive all who sinned against me. And I ask for forgiveness, Lord. With that confession, I command every unclean spirit to go now in Jesus' name. The people of God have spoken, they've been forgiven, and they ask for forgiveness, and they've forgiven those who've sinned against them. So right now, any demonic spirit, you have no more authority to stay. In the name of Jesus, we command you to get out now in the name of Jesus. And right now, we ask for the healing of God is healing anointing to come on people now. And right now, any sickness and disease, go now in Jesus' name. You have no more right to stay. Any foul, unclean spirit, I command you to leave in Jesus' name. Any spirit of torment, any spirit of infirmity, go now in Jesus' name. Right now, in Jesus' name, I command all who are sick to be healed in Jesus' name. All who have a physical problem in their body, in Jesus' name, I command it to be healed right now. If you have pain in your knees, you have pain in your legs, if you have pain in your back, be healed in Jesus' name right now. We thank you, God. We speak to these backs, we speak to these legs, we speak to these knees. In Jesus' name, be healed. Speak to these shoulders in Jesus' name. Be healed right now in Jesus' name. Minds, be healed in Jesus' name. Anxiety, go right now in Jesus' name. Fear, be gone in Jesus' name. Lack of energy, be gone in Jesus' name. Lack of clarity to your lungs, I command you to go in Jesus' name. 
command fullness to come to your lungs right now in Jesus' name. I command fullness to come to your breathing right now in Jesus' name. For your nostrils to be clear in Jesus' name. Allergies, I command you to go in Jesus' name. Sinus infection, I command you to go in Jesus' name. Colds, coughs, I command you to go in Jesus' name. Flu, I command you to go in Jesus' name. Stomach problems, I command you to go in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. We praise your name, Jesus. We accept your sacrifice, Lord. Your sacrifice was given to us, Lord Jesus, that we might be healed. It was a gift from heaven. And Lord, I want to thank you, Jesus, for your sacrifice. Is everyone served? Okay. Brother Robert needs... Brother Robert needs a... So, I want to, again, thank you for coming today. And maybe you don't feel a change immediately in your body. Maybe you, maybe you did feel something. Maybe you didn't. We walk by faith and not by sight. And I want you to know that I want you to continue to pursue God. If you're hurting in any way, continue to ask God for help. In James, it says to go before the elders to ask for help too. It's okay to ask for any of us to pray for you. We want to see healing too. Maybe there's even brokenness in families that God wants to heal right now too. Sometimes people have broken families um, where sons and daughters don't love their parents don't love their children. God wants to restore families. So with everybody served, the night that Jesus was betrayed, he said, do this in remembrance of me. And he took the bread and he said, this is my body that's been broken for you. We take the bread as a symbol of Jesus' body for for being broken for our healing. We take it for healing. Take the bread in Jesus' name. affliction, Lord Jesus, on your body, that we might be free from affliction. Thank you that your body was broken. That same night, he said, this cup, he said, this, this is my blood. It's so important. This is my blood. It's for your forgiveness. come to cover you with my blood, to wash you clean, that now you can stand before God completely free, completely and totally redeemed. When, Jesus, when God looks on us now, he sees the blood of his son, Jesus. He sees the precious blood of Jesus. And he says, there's nothing wrong with the blood of Jesus. So we take the, the cup for forgiveness. Lord, forgive me of all my sin. I forgive all those who sin against me, Jesus. Take the cup.
want you to know that we're here for your healing. If you need prayer in any area, maybe you even need a new job. God wants to provide for you. He's given us a mighty inheritance and favor, undeserved favor. It's called grace. And he doesn't give us what we do deserve. It's called mercy. So if you want to come up, if you need prayer for any area in your life, if you need healing, we're here for you. Service is over. You're dismissed. But if you need healing for anything, you can come here. The clinic is open. We're here to pray for you. I lift my head.